secondly, I'm going to record. Okay, so I was just saying uh, before I realized that I was not recording this app to reports feature development webinar, that this is going to be a little bit of a weird one. Um, now, I understand that number one, we all have been generally trained to specific standards like BPI or ResNet, um, or more and more, you know, ASHRAE and uh, NCI and all kinds of different things. So, so there's one thing, um, and I see those as a good place to start, but not the end of the line. Second thing that I also realize on the other side of the coin is that I am pushing the envelope pretty hard and not everyone is gonna to wanna to be doing what I am doing. So that being said, today I'm gonna uh, unveil the beginnings to you of Afterports 2.0. Afterports 2.0 is gonna be above and beyond the BPI, ResNet, all that stuff that we all learned because I think that there is, um, as you know, I'm big on the private market. I think that regular homeowners uh, in two scenarios, when they either are considering improving their home, and that can be with anything at all, uh, or when they know for a fact that they have a problem, those are the kind of clients that I personally am interested in, and I think that all of us should be interested in. I don't think that we should be following um, the old model of energy audits, meaning that they come out of nowhere, everybody's going along just fine, and then you get an audit, and it's like, oh, actually, we've got all these opportunities for improvement, and even when we call them that, or if we call them problems, like, oh, you didn't, you didn't even know that you were living with all these problems in your house, that's really not, I think that's an old-fashioned way to go about that. Um, I'm going to talk a lot deeper about that at Habitat X uh, in Montana in July. So if you guys are able to make it to that, it's a pretty cool little think tank. I don't go to conferences. If you have noticed um, that you've been to conferences in the last couple of years and not seen me there, I make a policy of not going to conferences because I don't like how they um, operate in general. I don't like how they pick their presenters or appreciate their presenters. Um, so this is my little form of protest. But there is one conference that I'm going to, and that is the Habitat X think tank. So it's small. It's in Montana. Um, anyway, if you get a chance to go, I'll be there and I'll talk more in depth about um, kind of my overarching philosophy change in the last year or two here. Um, so that being said, App Reports 2.0, which begins today, is going to be um, a little bit of a departure. So you can always, just like you always have been able to, download the older archived versions of App Reports and work with those. Um, so that we are all on the same page about this. And by the way, I'm going to go ahead and just talk for a little bit and give you the tour, and then I'm going to open back the, the, the questions pane back up. But I'm not looking at it right now. So if you type something in, don't think I'm ignoring you. Um, right now, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 tabs in After Reports. I think that's too much. Um, I don't know about you, but I am an idiot, and I don't like to multitask, and I don't think that making something more complicated and more complex is necessarily making it better. So I have been trying, um, here I'll show you what my software has evolved into, my personal software. Do 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 do. So this is my version of App Reports, and I still have a number of these, but I'm going to be getting rid of one, uh, two, two of these, and I and I have about seven or eight less. So I've got approximately ten tabs in mine, and I think that's as much as I want to do. Um, as you can see, I changed my logo in all of these uh, reports. Um, that took me just a, a day. I rebranded my um, company from the Green Dream Group uh, way of, of branding myself back to Building Performance Workshop. I'm a one-person company with two divisions to my company, and I think that's pretty silly. So anyway, Building Performance Workshop, I think, says more accurately what I'm trying to do. So as you can see here also, I've gotten entirely rid of the um, what used to be here, which was the uh, specific problems like, oh, do we have a whole house fan? Check yes, et cetera, et cetera. And now I just literally type in what I want to say. I want to say, um, you know, whole house fan. Then I go into my 
recommendations report, and that literally is right here, so that I can remember when I'm typing up my recommendations what I was recommending from this other page. So I've kind of gotten way, way more customized with all of my clients. Um, and that being said, this App Reports 2.0 is going to be designed for people like me uh, who are highly trained, highly experienced. Um, it's not going to be necessarily perfect for your employees. So I realize that that is an issue, but this is, I think, the future of where we're all going. So that's why I'm going to go ahead and uh, at my wife Grace's recommendation, go ahead and build App Reports 2.0. So like I said, you can always, always go back to the basic uh, way that we used to have things where it was like, you know, this problem, check yes, this problem, check yes, so that you can build in a script for your employees. But to me, I think that the best way to do this is if we're going to be ninjas, and this software pretty clearly is for the ninjas of the industry, if you want something that's a script to follow, there are five to 10 other softwares that you guys could have chosen. And the reason that you chose this is because it's modular, it's customizable, it's the Ninja software. So I'm gonna go ahead and just make it even more Ninja than it was. Um, so we've got the fields data. Now I've condensed this features list here, and I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger so we can all see. The features list is condensed so that we've got the kind of overview of what we've got going on basically with the enclosure. Uh, we also, of course, have the inventory of appliances down here. Now, I have taken this appliance list uh, because I've had a number of clients in the recent um, months who had a ridiculous amount of equipment, and I just put make, model, year, kilobit you in, kilobit you out, stated efficiency, year manufactured, design flow, meaning airflow, delta T at low, delta T at high, bam, so that I can put in furnaces, I can put in wine cellar air conditioners, I could put in um, snow melt heaters for the front sidewalk, any of that stuff. Um, so I just didn't, I felt a little hemmed in by the idea of just furnaces, ACs, and water heaters and boilers. Uh, so anyway, that's what I've done there. And also I didn't like having to jump around in here. So you guys can't see my screen. I'm getting a, a message that from somebody that they can't see my screen. Please let me know if you cannot see this. Okay, good. All right, so um, anyway, as you can see here, we've got this stuff. Now, what I am going to do is, first of all, I changed efficiency percentage to oxygen percentage because I think that's a more true, I don't know if you, how much you guys know about the uh, percentage efficiency calculation in your combustion analyzer, but it's based on a number of things, including carbon dioxide and oxygen and all that stuff. So I figured since we're into the raw data, let's just put the raw data in here. Now on the last webinar, one of uh, the After Reports users, I can't remember which one, I apologize, um, taught us how to do something, which is really cool. So uh, I decided to go ahead and put that into everything. Now uh, I'll show you what they um, demonstrated to us. I'm gonna zoom in here for draft. We don't have to put Pascals up here and then just put numbers down here if we don't want to. We could actually program all of these to be uh, already pre-programmed to show Pascals when it shows up. So we're just gonna go up to Format, Cells, Custom, and then uh, I happen to have them built in here already, but I'm just gonna show you how to do this. Uh, you would type in 0, 0.0 or 0, 0.00 or 0, 0.000 if you want however many decimal places. If you don't put any 0, 0.000 at all, then it'll just be no decimal places. It'll just round for you. And then you can hit spacebar and put quotation marks around whatever it is that you want to show. So specific unit is what would go in there. And that basically is how you're going to do that. So um, here we've got this built in. So I've got 0, 0.0 and then in quotes PA for Pascals. So now when I type in a number here, just like nine and I hit enter, it shows up as nine Pascals. Those are both, by the way, terrible draft readings. So please uh, <laughs> know that for, for your work out in the field. Um, okay, so these recommendations are now programmed uh, to show up in the opportunities for improvement 
report up here. So they're going to show up here as a reminder to you as you're building your opportunities for improvement report of what you wanted to say. There are 12 lines here, and I think that in general, for any given house, 12 is a is plenty. If you need more, obviously, you've got the second page of notes, and you can just type to your heart's content down here, uh, and all that makes you happy. So as you can see, I'm starting to fill this in. Now, this is not a finished product, what I'm going to show you today. I'm going to show you where we're going with this, and in the next week or two, I will be releasing this thing to you. So You'll get an email about that. I'm going to put in as many notes as possible. I'm also going to release a video showing you how to do this extra testing. I took a class recently, um, which is on a program that is a utility, a performance-based HVAC program for utilities. It's called the HVAC Save, and I think it stands for um, uh, Verification of Equipment and blah, blah, blah. I don't know. Save stands for something. Anyway, um, the uh, curriculum is pretty good, and it, it explains some things on how to simplify the process that I have been working on for the last year and a half, um, which, if you remember, was kind of ornery, and you had to measure the dry bulb and wet bulb at all of the registers and get all of the air flows and all that stuff. And they basically said, you know what, if you get three, that basically will work for you. So I th thank you very much, David. David is pointing out that it's system adjustment verification efficiency. Mm, not sure how much I uh, am a fan of that. Uh, I like the SAVE acronym. I'll just say that. <laughs> but basically, it's a performance-based HVAC incentive program. Um, and I, I highly recommend the way that they approach it if you have a utility program that's, that's looking to work with um, a program uh, kind of standard or guidelines this this seems to be pretty good so anyway i'm going to be building this out and there's going to be more information here what i think i'm going to do actually and i'm just going to jump ahead and go straight over here we're going to talk about cooling delivery today now in the first first thing real quick before i get into that um as always we've got the advanced leakage quantification for an outside zone advanced leakage quantification for an inside zone the report cover the opportunities for improvement, which I call the recommendations, um, your library, which comes pre-populated with just a few things, and you uh, are, you know, hopefully out there kind of every time you build a report, you take the recommendations that you built, you generalize them, and you pop them into your library so that you've got access to them later. I literally add two or three recommendations every single time I build a report. Um, I changed the air, what was it called? It was called airflow and pressure report to air leakage, and now it's called air leakage analysis because we wanna call things what they are. Don't make it hard for your clients to read your reports. So um, I'm gonna keep on evolving these, but basically what we did is put the arrow for how many CFM we have at present, how many we want to have, and this, by the way, right now, is based on the air changes per hour at 50. Now, my state is on five, not three, so I would call it five because what I want to do is compare everything all of the existing homes that I'm testing to what they would have to be if they were built from scratch today as a D minus grade, and that's five air changes per hour. Um, if you want to be building to three, that would be uh, the highest air leakage allowed by International Energy Code if your home was built today. Three is not probably going to change anytime soon. You could change that if you've got, you know, you only work for badass clients, you could change it to 0.6 and make it passive house, whatever you want. So basically you just need to go in here and change the calculation obviously. Right here is three times M17 divided by 60. So the three is the number that you would change. Um, like I said, I compare mine to five. Now, why do we do that? Just as a reminder, the N factor, the height corrected N factor does not exist anymore. And I will remind you that it is uh, not anywhere in your inputs screen in Afterports 2.0 because it's not a real thing. Uh, BPI doesn't even uh, recognize it anymore. So if we're using that, then we want to get rid of it and we want to start using the ACH50 target that we're used to um, with new construction. And comparing existing homes to new construction is not a problem. It's we're all just kind of using, you're just using math. And remember also, if you haven't seen my zonal pressure testing defense video, it's about motivational metrics. And I'm going to talk more about that um, as we go on into the future. That's a big deal. So whatever it is, however you're going to metricize your results, make sure that it's in a motivational way. It's something that is achievable for your clients. 
Um, so we're working towards a goal, and for most existing homes, three, they're never going to hit it. So let's just point them towards it and get them to, to make some steps down there. Okay, so that's one thing. Also, the uh, zonal pressure test, I put a little explanation here. And it says parts of your home were partitioned off, and the resulting zonal pressure proportions tell us how much opportunity for improvement there is for air sealing. Bam. So that basically explains it. Now, this zonal pressure proportions, I want to give props to uh, Curran Hoff, who is one of the apt users in the Netherlands. Let me see if he's on here, actually. Do, 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 do. Nope, uh, Curran's not on here. So he uh, said, you know, this whole zonal pressure percentage thing that people have been giving us a hard time about, um, really, mathematicians just make up numbers all the time. You just make up a unit. So what we did is just made up a unit called zonal pressure proportions, ZPP. And then we can say this thing is 80% ZPP, which doesn't necessarily mean it's 80% connected to outdoors or 80% connected to indoors or whatever it is. Um, it's our own number. So we get to say whatever we want. Um, so that's kind of how we're, we're uh, approaching this at this point. And I, I think that's a smart idea. So that's one thing. The other thing is that on the air leakage uh, and duct analysis, duct leakage analysis. I renamed this so that it's air leakage and duct leakage analysis. And I put the arrow in here as well so that we've got the current and where we want to go with it. Um, this one didn't really have room to explain what this is, uh, but it's just, I don't think that's too much of a problem. I think most of us are not doing duct leakage tests on existing homes. So um, tell me if that's not true. Also, you guys, tell me if like I, hearing from you of what you want is helpful. So that's part of what today is about. I am going to show you where I'm going with this software on my own. But if I start going off into like a black hole somewhere, please let me know. Um, obviously, this software came from my brain. My mother and I, my mother helped me build this thing. Um, so it was for me initially. And I designed it into something that could be used by you at the request of a uh, so many students asking me, hey, can we get a hold of this? Because there's nothing else that's really quite like it. Um, so I want it to be useful for you. But I am, I, because I use this on my own, I'm going to be doing with it what I think should be done with it. So anyway, if this becomes totally unusable for you, I do want to know because, you know, I, I don't want to make it obscure and crazy. Okay, so... There's that. That's the only other thing really that I changed, except I changed this combustion analysis and safety test. This is the BPI tab. Okay, so everything that's on this tab is standard BPI. I'm not going to be taking this tab away because some of us like to use BPI uh, standards when we're testing things, and that's totally fine. You should still feel free to do worst case depressurization and carbon monoxide and flue gas spillage, cooking safety, gas leaks, and combustion analysis overall. However, I would like for you to know that I do not do this anymore. Um, I, because I don't ever work with programs as a policy, I only work in the private market for private homeowners. I don't have to con uh, work on anybody's guidelines except for my own. No one asks me if I'm BPI certified. No one asks me if I'm a HERS rater. What they get my information from is their friends and family and neighbors who know that I know how to solve problems for them. And I wish that same thing for you. So I am the guy in Chicago that if you have a weird problem with your house, I can figure out what's going on. And each of you is totally able to do that. And all you have to do is use a copy of my book, get the equipment that you need or rent it, um, as I do often as well, and then just get more experienced with the testing. And that's it. So once you have got the testing under your belt, the testing is it. The testing is everything. You could have a million years of building science experience, and if you do not test, you don't know what's going on. And I can tell you that I work with people who are building science uh, heavy, and they don't test, and they don't have the right information. So if you test, it doesn't matter how much experience you have in building science, obviously more is better. And I will say that after seven years of being in houses and making a ton of mistakes and learning new things on every single job, um, I definitely am much better at my job now than I was when I first started out. But regardless, the testing is the thing. So feel free to test with the BPI, but I have entire jobs nowadays where I do absolutely 0% of anything that is on this page. 
because that is not what I've called there to do. I'm called there to solve a comfort problem or to solve an air quality problem. And I know for a fact that all the equipment is sealed combustion or power vented. And I know for a fact that the client has uh, way more problems then they have money to pay me to be able to find all of the solutions to their problems. So I'm going to focus on what I'm being paid to do and not finding a whole bunch of stuff. This is the auditing mentality that's like, ooh, you probably don't even know about any of this stuff, and I'm going to find the problems that you didn't know about. If the client, my client, calls me, they have a specific problem, and my main job is to solve that specific problem. If I get there and within an hour I have solved that problem, then I can go and find all these problems that they didn't even know that they had. But in the meantime, my job is to absolutely find the solutions to the things that they've asked me there for. So let's get into the seriousness here. Um, I'm going to close the questions pane so that I can see what's going on. Okay, so... AC cooling delivery. This stuff obviously up here is going to be the, the date and name and address of your client. AC cooling delivery is paired up with right here, heating delivery. This All this follows combustion. I'm assuming that most of you guys are still going to want to do BPI uh, combustion testing, um, which is, again, totally fine. And I'm going to leave this in here. I'm not going to take it away for Afterports 2.0. Um, but the heating delivery and cooling delivery is much more awesome in my opinion. So heating, AC cooling delivery, furnace heating delivery, neither of these is a boiler system. This is not for chillers or water cooling or anything like that, geothermal. Um, geothermal could be used for the furnace heating and for the AC cooling, but you'd have to know how to test uh, some other stuff with those systems. So we're not going to worry about that for right now. We're just working at the, the forced air level. So uh, over here, as you can see, we've got all the inputs. Putting all of these inputs on the fields data screen, first of all, would be almost impossible because it's literally taking up, as you can see, an entire page, um, half a page of fields. Second thing is, I'm assuming that a lot of you guys are not going to be uh, using this page at all uh, because you're not quite experienced enough yet. You're, it's going to take a while for you to feel comfortable enough to, to use it um, if, you're, if you haven't started with any of this stuff at all. Now, like I said, I'm going to make videos about this um, in the next couple weeks, and I'm going to release this version in the next couple weeks. So you'll have a chance to kind of screw around in here. But the way that it's programmed basically is as such. Uh, I'm going to get rid of all these fields real quick so that you can see me do this. Okay. So the AC tonnage delivery, and I'm going to go ahead and, and make this big. The AC tonnage for, uh, let's, I'm going to use my house as an example because I know everything about it. It's a two ton system. Bam. So that comes out as 2.0 tons because of course it could be 2.5 tons instead. Um, I, you notice that I didn't type in tons. I used that super cool trick that someone, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember who, if you can remind me who reminded, who taught us how to do that, um, programming of new units in here, that'd be super cool. Um, and I'd be happy to uh, give you props. So design BTU delivery is this number, 2 times 12,000, because there's 12,000 BTUs per ton. And the design airflow is 2 times 400 CFM, because there's 400 CFM per ton of cooling. And that's a really static number. That doesn't really change. If you're in the desert or you're in Florida, that might go up or down by you know, 10 15%, something like that. But it's not going to vary too much. And you can, of course, change that because you have access to the formula right here. So if you are in the desert and you want to make this 500, by all means, do that. Um, I am not going to do that because I am not in the desert. And if you're in Florida, feel free to change it to, you know, 325 or whatever you want. Maximum design total external static pressure. And if you don't know what static pressure is, I'm sorry for the next uh, half an hour because none of the rest of this is going to make too much sense for you. But um, review it when, you, when I make the video for you. But the total external static pressure is in my book. It's 2.3 or 2.2 or something like that. Um, anyway, most of the time it's half an inch of water column. If it's different in your particular case, feel free to put, you know, 0.8 or 0.6 or whatever it is that you find. And this is always on the equipment label. Okay. So the, uh, way that we're going to do this is get the static pressure drops, um, for three different things. We're going to find the total external static pressure. And then we're going to find the pressure drop for the filter and the pressure drop for the coil. 
uh, this is going to give us a really good, solid, meaty amount of information. So if you know what I'm talking about at this point, then follow along. The entering pressure at the equipment is going to be after the filter that's on the between the fan, the blower, or the air handler, and the filter, right? That's inside the blower cabinet. And I'm going to make up a number of um, 0.35. Now, I am not going to do negative 0.35 because that's going to kind of screw up my math here. So I'm going to use all positive numbers for this. Okay, so 0.35 is what I'm putting in here. The exiting pressure is the pressure uh, after the heat exchanger of my furnace. And if I only have an air conditioning unit, um, then I don't have to worry about the heat exchanger. And it's after the, the coil, basically. Uh, external static pressure means all of the external stuff aside from the equipment. So that's what we're measuring right now. So the exiting pressure, you may have to drill a hole. In fact, in general, you do. You're going to have to drill a hole in the furnace. It's going to be at the top of the furnace right before the coil of the air conditioner. So I'm going to make up an exiting static pressure of um, 0.25. Uh, we'll do that. And I've got a total external static pressure of 0.6. You can see right here that I have explained for my homeowner the pressure performance. Static pressure is like blood pressure. Too much, and it makes the heart of the system, in this case the central blower fan, work way too hard. So I've got my return external static pressure, my supply external static pressure. Both of these are in inches of water column, which is how you always measure HVAC pressures. The total is in red because it happens to be over this. Um, so that's what we want to uh, to be able to, to pinpoint. So here we can see that the return is having a much harder time than the supply. The su this return is giving more uh, pressure, more pushback, essentially, to the fan. So now let's figure out what exactly the problem is. The ductwork static pressures. So the supply pressure drop, and this is actually, uh, oh, this is kind of cool. I can actually, um, I'm going to do this real quick. Watch me work my magic. So I'm going to make both of these white, not gray, and these are going to self-populate. This pressure is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, not that. It is, do, 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 bam. And this is, bam. And then this is, uh, uh, uh. Okay, good. So what we just did is um, making our lives a lot easier. So we only have to take one, two, three, four pressure readings. Okay, we're going to take one uh, on the far side of the filter, the entering side of the filter. We're going to take one on the exiting side of the filter. We're going to take one before the AC coil, and we're going to take one after the AC coil. And those are our four readings, and they're going to populate a whole bunch of stuff for us. So before the filter, and now, if you can imagine here, the entering pressure on my equipment is 0.35. I'm going to say the entering pressure on my filter is 0.15. Um, and then past the coil, it was 0.25. I'm going to say it's 0 0.10. Okay, so now we have all of this stuff. And you can see that we have explained this to... Uh, oop, no, we haven't explained it to our client. We've explained it to ourselves uh, right now. And as you can see, like I said, this is all in development. Um, so I'm designing it for myself, and I'm going to—I'm uh, using the After Ports template as my playground, and then I'm going to program it into my own software. Um, so I'll—you'll get the final version of what I use. Okay. So basically, what we found out is, first of all, the total external static pressure is too high, by a tenth of an inch. Now that's in real life, you're going to have more like 0.75 to one inch. I had several clients in the last month who had over an inch of water column on their uh, systems. Now this is being really, really nice, right? So we've got 0.6. This is a pretty well installed system. The 0.6 though still is outside design specifications for this particular piece of equipment. So um, what we want to do is figure out where it's coming from. So the supply pressure drop is 0.1 and that's actually what you're aiming for. That's uh, always good. 0.15 for the return means that the return might be a little bit undersized or taking too many turns, things like that. So we want both of these to be about 0.1, um, the way that I understand it. And again, not an HVAC expert. In fact, I get corrected all the time. And so uh, I say things 
and uh, people correct me. So feel free to correct me if you do know better. So the total pressure drop of the ductwork is 0.25. The filter static pressure, which might be feeding into this 0.35, is 0.2. Hmm, that's kind of high. If we can make that more like 0.1, that would be making it easier for air to actually flow. So I can see that this all, the math all already happened. On the coil side, my coil pressure drop is 0.15. And based on the documentation from the coil manufacturer, which I don't have because I am coming along after this thing was already installed and it's long gone, um, you could call up the manufacturer and ask, but the, the pressure drop of 0.15, that seems perfectly fine. So this is okay. Um, looks like the opportunity right now is in my uh, filter. It might be a little dirty, might be too small, uh, might be uh, narrow media where I should be using a high, uh, wide media, etc. Total tested airflow. Now, you can see up here, I was looking for 800, and it's always important when you're testing to know what you're looking for, what number you're looking for before you run the test. That way, if somebody comes in behind you right when you're finishing the test and they say, so what'd you find out? You don't have to say, oh, I, I need to do some calculations, right? Always try to avoid that. So my total tested airflow, let's say, is 700, okay? Um, the speed tap, and this is something that I actually just learned about, and I've been doing this for seven years. There are five wires in these furnaces that I have been uh, commissioning. And black, yellow, blue, orange, and red is the order of the speeds. These are wires coming from the fan, and you plug them into the circuit board so that with, when cool activates on the circuit board, it sends electricity to this little uh, nubbin that's pointing out, and you attach the black, the yellow, the blue, the orange, or the red to that little nubbin, and bam, you've got whatever speed that fan is programmed to work on from that wire. So uh, in this case, let's just say that I'm on blue, okay? Now, there's all kinds of different things that we could go into here. This is not an HVAC class that I'm trying to give. Uh, so if you have a, a ton of questions at this point, just hang on, hang tight. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is take the return and the supply dry bulb and wet bulb. And that's important only in cooling mode. When we go into heating delivery over here, which I have not done yet, I'm just uh, finishing up with the cooling side, you're only going to have to do dry bulb. That means just a thermometer, like a cooking thermometer would be fine. Um, in this case, because we're trying to measure cooling and drying with air conditioning, you have to have an, a thermometer that does both of these things. They're a little bit more expensive for sure. So we've got a return wet bulb of 78 and a, uh, excuse me, dry bulb wet bulb of 78.64 and a supply of 62.60. Um, then what we're going to do is, and this is a mad dash, this whole thing that we're going to do right here. So we're going to take the return and the supply, dry bulb wet bulb. Then we're going to run like crazy to the three, a selection of three distant registers in the system. And we're going to measure the dry bulb, wet bulb at each of those. And remember that your thermometer is going to take about 30 seconds to kind of equalize here. So you're going to have to literally haul ass to get to these places. So then we've measured these three at the registers. And what we can do is take an average of those three and assume that that would be the case for all of the registers. There's, there is a fair amount of assumptions here. And this is why I'm excited about this protocol that uh, I finally found because it's going to be actually doable. Even though there is assumptions built into it, it is motivational metrics. So it doesn't matter how pure your numbers are. It matters that you convince someone to make the numbers better and that it is possible to actually make those numbers better. So I'm going to say it again. It is not important how pure your numbers are. It is important that you are safe that you don't give anybody wrong information. But when we're talking about this kind of thing, your goal is to, you know for a fact that the ducts are leaky. If you tell the client that you have 400, uh, or in my case, 756 CFM of duct leakage at 25 pascals, what does that mean to my client? How can they, what are they supposed to do with that? You could say, oh, it's 15 or 22 CFM per 100 square feet. What does that mean? How do I get this language to communicate to my client, to motivate them, to spend money, to fix the problem, to make their life better. That is the goal. The goal is not numbers. Numbers are only a tool. So they can be used for the power of good or for the power of evil. 
All right, so now that we've got this, you're gonna have to, and I, man, I tried, I tried so hard, guys, to figure out how to get a calculation so we don't have to do this, but we're gonna do this anyway. So you're gonna have to go to a sacrometric calculator online. Um, so what I'm gonna do is enter the uh, average dry bulb wet bulb, and we're in IP units. This is imperial uh, units. This is um, standard value. So this is what everybody else in the, in the world uses. This is America, IP. Dry bulb, uh, average 66, wet bulb 62. The enthalpy, is 27, come on baby. Oh, it's not letting me copy it, that sucks. 27.77, okay? 27.77, all right. So the return enthalpy, let me go ahead and go back in here. Let's do, do. All right, return dry bulb wet bulb was 78. 64, that's 29. 0.15 and the supply enthalpy. Enthalpy, by the way, just as a side note, is um, the kind of combination. If you look at a psychrometric chart which has seven axes on it, it's pretty awesome. Uh, it will be. Uh, you need two axes to figure out what the um, the enthalpy is. So you can use dry bulb relative humidity, as you can see here or dew point temperature. So if you've got a thermometer that already does one of those and it doesn't happen to do wet bulb, that's okay. You can you can use any one of those things. Basically, you want to get the sensible temperature, the heat, and also the moisture. So uh, supply, do, 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 do. 62 and 60. Six T. 26.40. Okay, so now we can see, now this is not, uh, it can't possibly be right. What is wrong with this? Times, oh, oh, oh yeah, okay, that's okay. Um, okay, so he, what we just did is this. Uh, and I haven't programmed this yet, but basically I'm going to, I'm going to program this in front of you. Actually, I'm going to take some questions real quick while I'm getting ready to do this. All right. Uh, David, David was the one who showed us how to do the, uh, specific units. Thank you very much, David Kozer. So David says for the save program, I use six field piece ARH5 index, uh, psychrometric heads with ET2W wireless transmitter and EH4W wireless handle. Wow, that is a lot of, um, here, I'm going to post this in the chat so that people can see this. Okay, so that was from David Kozer, uh, and he is involved in the SAVE program, so that's cool. So that's six uh, wet bulb thermometers that are giving him wirelessly the uh, wet bulb dry bulb, and he's taking it on both sides, so like in the return, in the supply, and then at three supplies. What are you using the other one for, David? There's If there's six. Also, I've got somebody with their hand up here. Let me take a look here. What do you do? No, no, no. Okay, cool. Oh, no, they took their hand down. If anybody does have a question, feel free to, if you want to talk, I would be happy to unmute you, but I only unmute people you know, uh, one at a time. So again, if you want to uh, have a part of the conversation, please raise your hand. It's the little hand button on your control panel. Um, or you can just write in the question pane, hey, unmute me, and I, I'd be happy to do that. So David, we were wondering what the extra, the sixth temperature probe is for. Maybe you're just using it out in the living space. Anyway, while you're answering that, so the tested cooling capacity uh, is a very specific formula. It equals 4.5 times the tested CFM times the uh, difference. Oops, nope. 
in enthalpy, which is right there, bam. Okay, so what we just found out is that uh, this thing is supposed to be moving, come on baby, Bam. All right. So, uh, and I just made these numbers up. So the tested cooling capacity is 8,600. And I think I'm actually going to make this in tons instead of in BTUs per hour because uh, homeowners aren't going to know about that stuff. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, good. Okay, cool. So David's doing three supplies and three returns. Now, the return thing, um, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm not theoretically... Uh, I'm not a purist, but the theory of the return temperatures, I'm not super sold on. So I'm, uh, anyway, that's, that's my thing about that. That's, so I'm not building it into this software, but you certainly can, if you would like to. Um, so that's good. So David's doing three supplies and three returns and assuming that's not a central return. Okay. So in order to do tons, let's follow along. So we're going to do, uh, this. Oops, that. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring you in here so you can see what I'm doing. 4.5 is a is a uh, common uh, like it's a coefficient basically that takes into account weight of the air and the blah 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 all this stuff. It's kind of general. Times N28, which is the cell that contains our tested CFM airflow times N53, which is our change in enthalpy. And the enthalpy, again, remember, is the sensible heat and also the latent heat, which is the humidity in the air. So we're going to do that divided by 12,000. And I'm going to come back out here. And I'm going to make this a, a, a custom unit. Come down here. And I'm going to make it 0.0, .0 tons. So it comes out to 0.7 tons. And this I'm just going to change to. Bam. Okay. So I've got, I bought two tons. And I'm sorry that this is doing that still. But I'm only getting 0.7 tons out of this. And again, I made these numbers up. So this is not an actual test. Uh, this could be totally ridiculous what I just made up. So the cooling delivered to rooms is going to be slightly different. And this is, again, using the idea, the um, concept from the... What's wrong with this? Hmm. Whatever. Okay, so the cooling delivered to rooms. Um, so what it says here on equipment cooling delivery is your AC ideally cools and dries your home. And you deserve to know if you're getting what you paid for from your equipment. Remember, if you are an AC installer, you tell your client that you deserve to get the best out of this and I am not gonna leave here until I give you what you paid for. You are hard on yourself as you are on other people and people respect that. So like if you say, oh, I'm all about data, but then you don't test your own equipment to find out if you actually gave them what they're you know, paying for, that's kind of weird and people will start to understand that mm, you're not really about performance. So go ahead and be super honest and like, hey, I this is hard to do. That's why you're paying me what you're paying me. Uh, and remember, you can charge whatever you want when you can do something right. And by the way, there is a really good podcast I listened to yesterday on Planet Money. If you guys don't listen to this podcast, it's, it's very good. Uh, it was about um, fluctuating. It's called the price tag, the death of the price tag, I think. And basically what they figured out is that nowadays, because of the internet uh, and computers, price tags, meaning that something would have the same price every day and for every person, is totally gone by the wayside. When you go on Amazon and you shop for anything today, that price is totally fluctuating 
and you check back in an hour and it'll be different. And you are checking from a different part of the country, and it'll be different, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So Coca-Cola just did this thing with their vending machines where they, when it's hotter outside, it's got a thermostat on the uh, machine, on the vending machine, and it will raise the price of the bottles of soda that you will buy based on the temperature. So when it's hotter, Coke is more expensive. That is okay. Remember, do not be afraid to charge what you are worth. All right. So th uh, there's a question here real quick. Uh, David points out that to qualify for the save program, you must have a save score of 85. And that save score is not built into app reports. That's uh, one of their things. So I'm, this is a little bit of a, um, this is my own thing that I've been working on. I liked the save curriculum and the save program because they simplify things. It's not super pure uh, in the same way that zonal, my zonal pressure testing proportions are not super pure, but they're motivational. And that's what I really like about that that program so that you won't see a save score in app reports uh, that being said you can build it in if you are part of that save program and you want to do that absolutely okay so um all right so then cooling delivered to rooms it says of course the duct system has a major impact on how much cooling power you actually feel in the rooms in your home here's how they affect the overall performance so the ac temperature before ducts we found out was, and this is, again, a little bit of a bastardization of what uh, we've done over here, but, and I haven't totally figured out whether this is exactly what I want to do or not, was um, the supply dry bulb, 62. After the ductwork, this is this. So before ducts, 62. After ducts, 66. Cooling loss from heat bleed. Now this, I'm going to have to actually uh, think for a minute. So if you guys don't mind, we still have 10 minutes in the webinar. You're going to watch me think out loud. Um, what we want to do, I'm just going to use this as a scratch pad down here, is take the uh, difference in temp before and after depths divided by, what are we doing here? All right, now this is where, if you guys want to chime in on this, we could do two things, and they're going to have much different effects, and I, I'm not sure that I've thought through exactly how this is going to work out. We can divide by either the return temperature, or we can divide by the outdoor temperature. Um, if you've got ducts in the attic, then really you'll be losing temperature to the attic temperature. And again, oh, in that case, we have to actually measure the temperature in the attic. So I'm not sure I like that. I think I'm gonna go with this one right here, which is divided by the return temp. So let's take a look at this. Uh, and I'm just gonna do this from scratch. So we're gonna do equals, because that's how you start every calculation. So conductive loss is gonna be this, minus this, and I'm going to put that in parentheses, divided by, is that right? Oh, hang on a second. We're going to do that, which is the difference Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go open with a parenth. We're going to do return dry bulb minus that difference divided by return dry bulb. Bam. Okay. So now we've got that. Um, and I don't want it to be quite that crazy. I want to just round off because remember, uh, you want to, um, come on, baby. You want to make things easy for your clients. Your clients do not care about two decimal places at all. So, uh, cooling loss. Ooh, we're going to have to do, we're going to have to do a flip because we, we, it's 95% is getting through is what we just figured out. I don't know how that's possible, by the way. And if you guys can see where my math is going wrong, please speak up. Um, 
and get rid of both of these here. I'm going to save. Well, anyway, you can see what we're going to be doing here. So I'm going to basically take this temperature loss that we got here, where it was down at 62, and then all of a sudden when it came out of the supply registers, it was all the way back up at 66, and the room temperature, the return temp, is 78. So that seems wrong. Um, anyway, we're going to build that in. 95 seems pretty high. I think that's wrong, so I need to check my math on that. But basically what we're going to do is say what the conductive loss and also probably the convective loss, but this is just cooling loss. Uh, don't, this is not about duct leakage. It's not about duct insulation necessarily. It could be a number of things. Remember, heat flows in three different ways, so it's all of those. Uh, and it has nothing to do with airflow at all. So once we've done that, then we'll be able to say, your system is performing Wow, this, why is this thing, I hope I didn't just do that. Your say AC is performing X well. And we're gonna make this a percentage. as designed. Okay, so we're going to do equals uh, what are we going to do? We're going to do we're going to do this divided by this times this. Bam. Okay, so that's, you can see where I'm kind of going with this. Anyway, that is what we're going to be able to give to people. Now, one of the things that I'd like to make sure of, and I will be testing this in a brand new building that I'm uh, commissioning, which is going to be part of the subject of the Mastermind webinar, which is on Wednesday, um, is making sure that this number on a brand new, excellently performing piece of equipment is actually going to be as close to 100% as possible. Because I don't want to give you guys the ability to go out and start telling people like, oh, it's only 34%. And then when you fix it, it's like 60%. Well, that still sucks. Um, so anyway, you can, you can see basically where we're going with this. So that wraps up what I am going to be giving you in the new version of APT 2.0. Um, these two, AC cooling and heating, uh, AC, uh, sorry, cooling delivery and heating delivery are going to be the major um, additions. I am at that point going to get rid of some things, um, which may include HVC airflows. If you guys want to keep airflows, to please speak up now or forever hold your peace. Do you want airflows kept in there? We can keep this thing at 17 or 18 um, tabs, but I, you know, it just seems like a lot to me. But if you guys are happy, if more is better for you, because you didn't, you know, you use this in a different way than I do, then please do speak up. Brian wants to keep it. Anybody else? No one else cares. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you win. <laughs> Fine, it's it's me against you. So uh, that's what we'll do. We'll keep it. Um, does anybody have any questions? Please raise your hand if you have a question or if there's something that specific that you wanted to work on for your own software. Um, remember, that's part of what we're doing here today is support, advanced support, and all that stuff. If you're not a user and you have a question, feel free to, to speak up too since my users are being um, shy. All right. Well, as we are closing out this webinar, I will remind you that the Fall Fast Track, if you pre-register for it um, before you actually enroll, and not everybody does this, which always surprises me, um, you get, number one, a free hour of coaching or consulting from me online. You get a free copy of my book or BPI exam prep or Raider exam prep. Uh, and you also um, get free bonuses, which I send you immediately. So if you want that stuff, just go ahead and pre-register. It's free. It doesn't take any actual work. And you'll get um, able to enroll in the course before I release it to the public. 
um, which means all the HVC guys in the world, which is uh, who is on Google+. Plus. If you don't use Google+, Plus, I, I highly recommend it because they run the universe of Google, obviously. So they have their social media thing, and they will favor you if you like their... <laughs> like, I don't like to pretend that they're going to be nice guys just because... Obviously, they want you to use their stuff. If you use it, I assume that they're going to give you some kind of a special placement on the search engine. So um, go ahead and get into that. And the HVAC community is big time into Google Plus because they are better business people than people in home performance in general. So you can hook up with a bunch of those people there. Anyway, pre-register for Paul Fast Track. Stay tuned to the videos. Um, I'm assuming that we don't have any questions. So I'm going to go ahead and close out the uh, webinar. And I hope that you guys have a great rest of your weekend. See ya.